Okay, members, it is time for questions to the Executive Office, and we will start with listed questions. And before I will call Mr. Pat Catney to ask the first question, I um, can I thank the First Minister for uh, facilitating today's uh, question session on behalf of the uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, so thank you very much, First Minister, and I now call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Question number one, Minister. Uh, thanks to the Speaker and to uh, Mr Catney. Uh, following executive agreement, the EU Future Relations team in the Executive Office has been coordinating readiness planning across all departments to include an option for a non-negotiated outcome. This work builds on preparations made in the lead-up to a potential no-deal exit uh, in 2019. The Executive Office has established an interdepartmental working group on operational readiness, which meets regularly to consider cross-cutting issues and challenges. And while we are preparing for a non-negotiated outcome, it is important to remember that the protocol will still apply in that scenario. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, would the First Minister, do you share my concerns that even if there is a deal by the end of the year, that we are too far behind in implementing parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol to avoid major disruption at the end of the transition period? I thank uh, the member for his question, and I, I hope he agrees with me that, uh, of course, the best outcome would be for uh, an agreement uh, between the European Union and the United Kingdom uh, so that we can move forward together. Um, but there have already been uh, some ways of dealing with what the member refers to. He will have noticed that in terms of qualifying goods um, uh, from the, going from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, uh, the SI already accepts that whatever is freely uh, available in Northern Ireland at the moment will be taken as qualifying goods. However, that will be revisited in July of next year. So there's already an acknowledgement that some of these issues uh, will not be ready in time. Uh, and that's the same whether goods are coming um, from uh, the Republic of Ireland through Northern Ireland into Great Britain or indeed from other places in the European Union into Great Britain. So there have already been um, some ways of dealing with the pressure that is undoubtedly there. Uh, and uh, I welcome the fact that there is that acknowledgement because it gives some certainty then to our companies. Uh, we'll continue to work with our colleagues uh, in uh, UK government to try and get more clarity for our businesses because we do recognise there's very much a need to provide clarity for our businesses mm -hmm. and also for our citizens as well. Nicole Pasheehan. I thank the First Minister for her answers uh, so far. And could I ask her to detail the scope of the work that the Operational Readiness Team is involved in? Well, as I've indicated to, to the House already, this um, group um, came into being after our executive meeting on the 15th of June, and it was really to provide that focus across uh, government, recognising that there are many departments uh, involved in operational uh, readiness. first meeting took place uh, of the Interdepartmental Working Group on Operational Readiness on the 1st of July 2020. They were initially meeting only on a monthly basis, but now the meeting follows on a fortnightly uh, basis. And whilst um, the non-negotiated outcome is very different from uh, a no-deal Brexit, which Operation Yellowhammer was uh, dealing with uh, this time last year, there are similar uh, themes and issues uh, arising. Um, a lot of preparatory work for Yellowhammer was undertaken, and we're building uh, upon that. Um, in the event of a non-negotiated outcome, and I very much hope that that isn't the case, uh, Mr. Speaker, because I think uh, for everyone that that would be the worst option if we didn't have a negotiated outcome. Nicole, Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister why uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin oppose delivery of the new decade new agreement commitment to establish an ad hoc assembly committee on Brexit? Well, because uh, we very much believe that there is a need for the executive uh, as a whole to discuss the issues that uh, are in front of us. Uh, we do that uh, every week at the executive subcommittee. Um, the place for scrutiny uh, of all of these matters are in the different departmental uh, committees, uh, uh, whether it is agriculture or economy or indeed the executive office committee. So setting up an additional level of bureaucracy uh, we felt was not the way to proceed, but instead to actually give the committees that have the scrutiny role their place 
uh, so that they could take the matter forward. Okay, thank you. And uh, before we move on to the next question, um, could I advise members that uh, question six has been withdrawn? Could I call uh, Jerry Carl? Question two. Junior Ministers Lyons, Kearney, and I met the US Special Envoy Mick Mulvaney for a wide ranging discussion on significant issues, including executive priorities, current challenges, and future opportunities. This included the challenges being faced both globally and locally as we work to combat the COVID 19 pandemic. They also addressed the issue, we also addressed the issues arising from the fast approaching end of the Brexit transition period and the challenges that that presents. Economic recovery was also a key issue discussed, and there was a particular focus on some of our important industry sectors, such as aerospace, alternative energy, and digital technologies, in which the Special Envoy has a keen interest. This was an important meeting to further develop our links with the United States as our biggest international investor and key supporter of Northern Ireland. Terry Carl, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Thank the Minister for answer, but I want to say categorically that Mick Mulvaney is no friend to the vast majority of people here in North and South. He's someone who described himself as a right-wing nutjob. He was, as Trump's chief of staff, pushed for slicing health care, opposed anti-poverty programmes and disability benefits, not to mention defending time and time again Trump's deplorable racism. I want to ask the First Minister, um, at any point did the Special Envoy discuss his newly created vulture fund, Exodus Capital, with any of the ministers? Well, no, he didn't agree that with any of the ministers, and uh, I have to take issue with the members' characterisation of the special envoy. I think that Mick Mulvaney is a friend of Northern Ireland. He has been appointed to do a job, and we look forward to working with him. Uh, we had some wide-ranging conversations, uh, in particular about alternative energy and um, the economy minister's desire to have a hydrogen hub here in Northern Ireland. Was something that we discussed with him. So uh, it was a very useful meeting. We will have further uh, meetings with the Special Envoy uh, in due course, and we look forward to him being able to assist us to get into uh, new businesses and indeed into new sectors uh, for the benefit of all of the people of Northern Ireland. I call Martina Anderson. Uh, Minister, do you share the concerns of a number of US political figures? about the implications of a no-deal Brexit on the Good Friday Agreement? Well, I, I have to say to the member, I am confident that uh, anything discussed thus far uh, in relation to us leaving the European Union, uh, including uh, the Internal Market Bill in Westminster, would not constitute any threat uh, to the Belfast Agreement. Uh, I think that that has been acknowledged by Mick Mulvaney as well when he was here. Uh, he made the commentary uh, around when he was asked and pushed about the internal market uh, bill. He, he made those comments. But of course, he, he wants us to proceed here in Northern Ireland, to work together for the benefit of all of the people of Northern Ireland. That's certainly what I'm committed to doing. Uh, and I hope that uh, when we do uh, transition out from the European Union, that we continue to do the work that is necessary here in Northern Ireland, working across all of the strands of the Belfast Agreement, of course, north-south, and indeed east-west as well, as well as uh, making this place operational and working for the good of everyone. Steve Egan. I thank indeed the First Minister for coming today and at such short notice. Um, on reference to the Special Envoy to the United States, did the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister get the opportunity to express to the a US envoy the importance of people in Washington actually reading the Belfast Agreement and actually understanding what is actually in the document. Well, unfortunately, the Deputy First Minister wasn't able to, to meet Mr Mulvaney. It was uh, myself and, and the two junior ministers that met on that occasion. Uh, but indeed, um, I hear the Belfast Agreement, uh, for others it's referred to as the Good Friday Agreement, uh, referenced on many occasions, and sometimes I wonder how it's have they actually read through uh, the contents of it? It's not a very long document, but it is a document very much worth uh, rereading again. Uh, and it has those three strands in it, and I'm sure the member is very much aware of that, the north, south, the east, west, the totality of relationships, recognising, of course, that it is for the people of Northern Ireland to determine their future. And that consent principle, as he well knows, lies at the very heart of it. Call um, Good to hear you meeting with Mick Mulvaney, uh, First Minister. I hope you enjoyed the crack with him and talking about his, his Irish roots, especially in County Mayo. 
Was a minute of the meeting kept, as was, as was suggested, in regard to openness and transparency under new decade, new approach? And if so, was one kept of the conversation with the Chinese consul to Belfast at your meeting earlier in the year? Yes, minutes are kept of all of the meetings in uh, conjunction with our new decade, new approach. Um, uh, those minutes are kept by our officials, uh, Mr. Speaker. Moving on, I call Emma Sheeran. Yes, over a tree, let it Sorry, number three, please. We all recognise the need to invest for the future in our infrastructure to ensure that individuals and businesses benefit from the best possible facilities and services. The investment strategy is the executive's strategic description of how it will focus its available capital resources to address the social and economic values and outcomes set out in the programme for government. The current investment strategy covers the years 2011 to 2021, and by March 2021, we expect that over 14 billion will have been invested in infrastructure under that strategy. The next investment strategy will be developed in parallel with the programme for government. It will be informed by the priorities and outcomes in the programme for government and by the overall expectation of public finance availability. Subject to the agreement of the executive, it is intended that the investment strategy will be brought forward during the 2021-2022 year. I'm a supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister outline how the Executive derives maximum social value from the money that's spent? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we do this uh, in a number of ways, and uh, the uh, Executive takes from uh, the Strategic Investment Board advice uh, on our strategy moving forward. And prior to 2019, uh, one of the primary ways by social achieved social benefit through public procurement was through targeted recruitment and training clauses requiring contractors to provide a proportion uh, of the total weeks of employment on the contract to new entrant trainees, uh, people who didn't have any substantial work experience such as school or college leavers or people who were and are long term unemployed. And that's very important because often when I meet uh, young people who maybe haven't um, succeeded in schools in terms of academic um, qualifications, they find it very difficult um, to get work experience. And I think this is one way that we can help young people uh, to get that work experience so that then when they apply for further jobs, they have something uh, to talk about in terms of that. Then in February of this year, um, we ex expanded the scope of the scheme to include ICT contracts um, uh, involved in, in the buy social as well. And uh, we haven't had formal approval from the procurement board in relation to that, but I think that that is another way that we can uh, involve the buy social uh, in our contracts as well and investment strategy. So there's a number of ways that we can help. Uh, and I think the strategic investment board is well aware uh, of the executive's desire to see this make uh, a difference uh, to some of our young people's lives. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the First Minister for her um, answers so far. But um, will the Minister give in assurances that any investment strategy will complement and ensure a commitment to Green New Deal policies? Yeah, so when the investment strategy was first uh, drafted, those are the sorts of things that we didn't really have involved in the strategy. But I think since then, in particular, climate change has become uh, a huge issue for. Uh, those of us involved in, uh, in procurement, uh, and we spend uh, a lot of government money here in Northern Ireland. It's important that climate change is part of that. I know the Minister for Infrastructure has her own body looking at uh, infrastructure now and advising her. Uh, so hopefully that will dovetail in with the investment strategy and that we will be able to take that forward. So absolutely, climate change is very much part of it. Nicole Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you, First Minister, for your answer so far. What efforts have been made to ensure that there is sub-regional balance um, in this investment strategy, and what is your understanding of what regional balance is? 
Well, as somebody from the southwest of the province, I very much want to see a regional balance uh, in our investment strategy. And I think if the Deputy First Minister was here, she would say the same uh, in terms of Mid Ulster. I think part of the advantage of devolution is the fact that you do have elected representatives in the executive from right across Northern Ireland. And therefore, there is a desire to make sure that the investment strategy works for everyone in Northern Ireland. Uh, and certainly for us, that will mean in the programme for government better outcomes for everyone uh, who lives here, not just those who live in urban destinations or in the east of the province or the west of the province, but everybody needs to be taken into account. And we will be, because the investment strategy has been looked at alongside our programme for government, those two things will work hand in hand. And I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question four. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, Junior Minister Lyons will answer this question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to date, uh, delivery partners have been appointed to deliver 30 individual projects covering a variety of themes uh, across the eight areas of focus for the project. Whilst the emergence of COVID-19 had the potential to disrupt implementation, delivery has continued throughout and good progress has been made across all projects thanks to the commitment, creativity and enthusiasm shown by delivery partner organisations supported by officials. The Communities in Transition project is designed to support, empower and equip communities as we work together to tackle the scourge of paramilitarism and coercive control within eight specific geographic areas. And without strong, positive, confident and resilient communities, paramilitary organisations and other similar malign influences can occupy the space that is created, thus limiting the opportunity for positive change and progress. The Communities in Transition project seeks to improve voice, access and agency in communities, thus narrowing the ground for other influences to exert control. A community-informed approach lies at the heart of the project, and we are committed to continuing to engage with communities throughout the delivery of the current phase of activity and beyond. Recently, Mr. Speaker, Junior Minister Kearney and I had the privilege of meeting with a number of community develop delivery partners, and I have to say I was particularly struck uh, at how uh, these groups worked together uh, and did what they could uh, very successfully to bring about solutions uh, at a local area. And we look forward to engaging with other delivery partners over the coming months. Thank you. Paula Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Junior Minister for certainly a very fulsome answer to my question. Um, to follow on from that, can I ask the Junior, junior Minister um, if he could provide details of phase two of the project? So, as the member will be aware, the Tackling Paramilitary Activity, Criminality and Organised Crime programme is currently due to expire in March 2021. The Executive has discussed and agreed in principle to a further phase of the Tackling um, Paramilitary programme to be delivered over a three-year period up to March 2024. And the CIT project will be a significant part of the community-facing element in the next phase uh, of the programme and subject to confirmation of budget and to ongoing government-wide budgeting exercise. Uh, it's hoped that the CIT project will have an indicative budget of £12 million. The interventions supported through the Communities in Transition project have been shaped and informed by communities in response to the very specific issues that manifest themselves in each locality. And the range of interventions continue to deliver much needed community responses at a time when positive community leadership is needed now uh, more than ever. We recognise the commitment and innovation that has been shown across these areas and assure our community delivery partners of our continued support uh, for this good work. Uh, and these projects must have the ability to uh, embed um, at, a, at a community level. And we're already seeing the impact of these interventions. Uh, and we must ensure that the necessary time is given to bring about the sustainable change and the positive legacy that all of our communities want to see. I call Dolores Kelly. Mr. Speaker, and I'm sorry to rain on the parade about communities in transition, but my experience is somewhat different where we're seeing a duplication of efforts. So in going to phase two, how are we going to ensure uh, that there's not duplication of effort and that uh, 
uh, that there's some point in time when communities in, in transition has to end 20 years post uh, the ceasefires on the Good Friday Agreement? So certainly if there are concerns that the individual member has in relation to certain projects, we'd obviously be happy to, to hear about these. I can speak from my experience of hearing from delivery partners that we have engaged with, and I've got very, very positive uh, feedback from that. Where there is a need, these programmes need to continue, especially if they're seeing the positive effects that we have seen uh, in certain projects. So I'd be happy to have this conversation further uh, with the member. I call Doug Beatty. Speaker, I thank the Minister so far for his answers. And uh, I mean, a Communities in Transition programme has some great uh, initiatives, um, but, but like the member across, uh, I'm not seeing the outputs that we're putting in. It, it's just not kicking out. So can I ask the Minister, how are we measuring these outputs, given the rise in, in our constituency area of paramilitary and terrorist activity? Well, Mr Speaker, obviously there seems to be uh, an individual uh, constituency uh, issue here uh, within uh, Upper Ban. I'm, I'm not sure of the individual projects that the uh, members have referred to, but as ministers we're always more than happy to engage with members to see uh, what's working and what's not working. Obviously there's different themes um, that CIT uh, involves itself in in, in different areas, uh, and perhaps we need to, to look at them. Certainly, from our point of view, we do see uh, where this is working and the positive impacts that's coming from it. So let's have that conversation uh, and let's make sure that we can see the positive developments in his constituency uh, that we're seeing elsewhere. And Jerry Kelly not being in his place, and move on to question number seven, Paul Frew. Thank the member for his uh, question. The Deputy First Minister and I have both affirmed the terms of the Pledge of Office as a condition of our appointments. The commitment to non-violence and exclusively peaceful and democratic means required by the pledge informs uh, us at all times uh, how we should discharge our duties as a joint office. Paul Frew, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, given the recent comments and behaviour of Jerry Kelly, MLA, uh, and of course the the past of that party, will the First Minister take the opportunity to remind this House of the obligations on MLAs to keep peaceful uh, means? Well, the member is right to make a distinction between uh, ministers and MLAs because the pledge of office does not apply to MLAs who are not ministers or junior ministers, um, but MLAs are governed by the Assembly Code of Conduct and must also uh, give an undertaking under Section 40A of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, which includes the requirement to, quote, support the rule of law unequivocally in word and deed and to support all efforts to uphold it. And I think all of us in this chamber, all of us who have the huge privilege of representing people uh, from our constituencies, need to remember that we've made that pledge of office and we should stick by it. I call Linda Dillon. The European Court of Human Rights Minister ruled unanimously that Article 2 of the Human Rights Convention guaranteeing a right to life had been violated at Loch Gaul. Does the First Minister accept that the comments of her party colleague, Paul Frew, on the anniversary of Loch Gaul created great offence and hurt to grieving families and that everyone has a right to remember loved ones, regardless of your view of those who died in Loch Gaul? I'm not aware of the comments of uh, the member she refers to. Uh, I am blissfully unaware, uh, Mr. Speaker, because I don't do Twitter. And um, I may post on Twitter, but I don't look at it. And I think I would advise members from right across this chamber that that's a very good thing to do. I call Jim Allister. Um, does the First Minister agree that when it comes to the pledge of office and the undertaking? To support the rule of law unequivocally in word and deed, that that is a solemn commitment, not a flexible commitment. And does she agree that the flagrant breaching of that rule of law, insofar as the coronavirus regulations are concerned, by her deputy first minister, has not only uh, driven a coach and horses through that pledge, but also, sadly, severely undermined the messaging? On COVID-19, well, I do agree with the member that it is uh, a solemn commitment and something uh, we should all think about uh, as we took that when we were elected to this place and reaffirmed it when this uh, assembly reconvened again. I mean, 
In terms of the uh, commentary around the Deputy First Minister, as the member knows, there is a police investigation going on into that event, um, and there's also an investigation uh, in this place, and we should wait for the outcomes of those investigations. But undoubtedly, there has been damage done to the messaging around COVID-19. I do regret um, that people are not complying in the way that we need them to comply uh, in order to stop the transmission of, of this uh, terrible virus. And I would ask them to go back to basics and please to adhere to all of the things that we talk about on a day and daily basis, that is washing your hands, keeping your distance, making sure that you wear masks in the appropriate places, having good respiratory hygiene. All of those things need to be repeated by all of us on an ongoing basis, because at the moment, we do have COVID transmission at a very high level. We have the unenviable position that part of Northern Ireland is the highest rate of transmission in the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, I, that is a hugely disappointing place to be, Mr Speaker, given our very good record during the first wave of, of COVID-19. And really, people need to get back to basics around this and try to help us work together as partners to move beyond this virus and to get to a place uh, where we can suppress the curve of the virus and make sure that we have space in our hospitals for those people who are unwell and who may need to go into intensive care as well. I call Carol Mullen. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, with your permission, Junior Minister Lyons will answer question number eight. Uh, TO's Urban Villages Initiative is currently developing the business case for this major regeneration project, which includes options for a mixed-use development that will offer a range of facilities for the benefit of the community. The project aims to reinvent the site as a shared space for fostering positive community identities, building good relations and harnessing wider economic and social benefits, reclaiming and repurposing a dilapidated site which has for far too long been a catalyst for antisocial behaviour. The business case is being prioritised with a view to being with a view to it being completed and ready for submission to the Department of Finance for approval by the end of this calendar year. Carmel, supplementary. Uh, and thank you, Minister, for your uh, answer there. We understand, in terms of processes and timeframes, um, that it can be very complex when dealing with private and public partners. But for the residents who have lived there from, and have seen the site dilapidated for many, many years, there was an expectation that this site would be developed this year. Can the Minister give a commitment that this project is being taken forward urgently? So, Mr. Speaker, there are uh, a number of stages to, the, to, to this development. First of all, obviously, as I've said, the business case has to go to the Department uh, of Finance, and that will include early designs, um, but then the final design will have to be subject to full planning um, application and consultation. Uh, in parallel, though, at the same time as the business case, uh, work is ongoing to secure purchase of the site before the end of this financial year, and on purchase of the site, all buildings will be demolished leaving a significant vacant uh, open space. Uh, in terms of funding, um, indicative costs are estimated to be around £5.5 uh, million. Uh, however, this is a key priority within the Urban Villages uh, Capital uh, Programme. Um, so there is a bit of a ways to go yet, so I would urge the, the member and her constituents to be patient. I call Gary Middleton. You, Mr Speaker, uh, the Minister will, will be aware that different departments have previously contributed to the funding of uh, transport to the Fountain Primary School. Uh, that funding is now coming to an end. Uh, can the Minister commit to looking to trying to pursue funding for that uh, transport, particularly given the fact that it is within an urban village area? Well, I thank the member for raising this issue, and it is one that I am uh, aware of, and I understand the importance of maintaining this transport service uh, for the young people that attend uh, that school. Uh, discussions are currently ongoing between uh, relevant departments in order for us uh, to find a solution, and I will certainly uh, endeavour to keep the member updated on developments. That uh, ends the period for a list of questions, members, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister for an update on the UK Government COBRA meeting she attended this week? Uh, yes, indeed. We did attend uh, the COBRA meeting this week on behalf of the 
uh, executive, both myself, the Deputy First Minister, and the Minister for Health, and the Chief Medical Officer uh, were all in attendance. Uh, at the meeting, we were given an update in relation to the current state of play from the Joint Biosecurity Centre. I think it's important that we hear what's going on from an epidemiology point of view uh, across the United Kingdom. And of course, the Prime Minister updated us in relation to his three-tiered approach uh, from an English point of view, hoping that, that uh, across the United Kingdom we would have similar approaches to allow us to access funding uh, to assist those uh, when we may have to uh, close down um, businesses or sectors. So it was an important meeting. Um, we have to follow up uh, on some of the issues uh, that were raised at the meeting. Chris Little, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the First Minister for her update. Can I ask the First Minister just how concerned she is by the alarming increase in COVID cases in Northern Ireland, which has seen seven deaths recorded since yesterday, 23 ICU admissions, 15 people on ventilators, the overwhelming of our contact tracing system and, regrettably now it appears, cancellation of elective surgery in Belfast, and indeed ask her what decisive action the Executive Office will be taking to arrest this situation. I uh, thank the member for his uh, question, and indeed we are uh, collectively very concerned uh, about the rise in transmission across Northern Ireland. The consequential uh, hospital uh, inpatients that are growing uh, on a daily basis. I understand currently are at 150 inpatients today suffering uh, from COVID-19, with, as he has rightly pointed out, 23 uh, ICU um, uh, beds now taken up. Uh, we are concerned about this, and indeed we will have an executive meeting later on uh, this afternoon uh, to discuss the issue and discuss what it is we can do as an executive to try and help halt uh, the rise of COVID-19. But we do have to be very clear, Mr Speaker, that whilst we of course have to halt the rise of COVID-19, and that of course is something that we are all very concerned about, it is important that we take a proportionate and balanced approach. Some people have said uh, it is about health versus wealth. I think that's a completely false analysis, uh, Mr Speaker, and, and indeed our own Chief Medical Officer back in May of this year um, made the point that poverty kills and unemployment kills as well. And therefore it is a balancing act uh, between making sure that we deal with COVID-19 but that we also try uh, and protect our economy, that we try and protect our society as we know it and indeed family life uh, as we know it as well. So these are huge decisions. None of it is easy, Mr Speaker. Um, we will come together to make those decisions later on this afternoon. I call Justin McNulty. First Minister, I and my fellow Gales in County Antrim, in Ulster, across Ireland and further afield are bouncing today. We very much welcome the decision from the, from the Infrastructure Minister today on Casement Park. Can the First Minister assure me, and indeed all other Gales, that commitments made in New Decade New Approach will be stood by and that funding will be made available to complete the construction of our Stadium of Dreams in Ulster? Well, I say to the member, it's good to hear him welcome a decision from uh, the Minister for Infrastructure. I don't think he was as fulsome in his praise, uh, Mr Speaker, at the last um, announcement that the Minister for Infrastructure made. But it's good to see that uh, uh, that has been healed by the announcement today in relation to Casement Park. Uh, in terms of Casement Park, as the Speaker will know, as the members will know, this was to proceed at the same basis as uh, Ulster Rugby, of course, the Kingspan Stadium, uh, and of course, Windsor Park uh, for the Irish Football Association. And it has taken a long period of time uh, to get the planning permission uh, in place uh, for Casement Park. Unfortunately, it now seems as if the cost has uh, risen as well, uh, and therefore there will have to be discussions uh, with uh, Ulster GAA in relation uh, to that, uh, because at the time that this was agreed, 
Uh, it was agreed at a level uh, that was showing parity uh, across the three uh, sporting codes at that time. So we look forward to discussions with the Department for Communities around this issue, uh, but it is a, a stage uh, I accept that a lot of people have been looking forward to, uh, and uh, it's good to hear that the member is back in line with the rest of his party. Justin McNulty, supplementary. Thank you, First Minister, for your answer. Orskath, Akila, Awarin, Nadini. First Minister, we rely on each other for shelter. When casement is completed, when our Stadium of Dreams is built, will you commit, if we are still in this place, First Minister, for attending the first Ulster final to be played in Casement Park alongside myself and other members of this House? Well, of course, one always waits on the invitation uh, to attend uh, these events, and uh, I look forward to that invitation uh, if and when it comes. Of course, Fermanagh may well be back in the uh, final by that stage, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, and we look forward to that day very much. Can I call George Robinson? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the First Minister outline the cooperation between the devolved administrations in relation to unresolved issues surrounding Brexit, and what representations has the First Minister had with Her Majesty's Government to ensure unfettered access for Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland goods across the United Kingdom? Yes, so the uh, cooperation and the conversations continue apace in relation uh, to this issue across the devolved administrations. Uh, we have many meetings, both with the Paymaster General uh, and uh, the junior ministers attend uh, some of those, and then with the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who leads on a lot of these Brexit issues. Um, the formal negotiating round, the ninth round, is now completed. Uh, we await to see if any more progress can be made between the uh, UK and the European Union. Um, we stand ready at all times to work with our colleagues in uh, HMG uh, around the issues concerning Northern Ireland. And I must say they have been very accessible uh, in relation to dealing with those issues. George Robbins, a supplementary. First Minister, <clears throat> for her answer. And uh, could I ask the Minister, is the Government of the Republic of Ireland cooperating in addressing the issues surrounding Brexit? Well, I think in terms of uh, our relationship uh, with Dublin, we do recognise, of course, that Dublin is a member state, that the Republic of Ireland is a member state of the European Union, and therefore the negotiations continue between the EU uh, and the UK uh, in that respect. Uh, however, there are many things in which we have common cause. Access uh, to the GB market, of course, is one of those, uh, making sure that we uh, are able to work together in the future. And, of course, the Republic of Ireland being the nearest neighbour of uh, the UK, uh, it's important that we work together on all of those issues. So we will continue to do our best to get the proper and right outcome in all of these matters and are happy to work uh, with colleagues in Dublin as well as, of course, with our sovereign government. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, First Minister, what actions are you taking to support the economy? You referred to earlier that you're, you're obviously having a meeting later on today of the executive, uh, and obviously big decisions to be made. What support are you going to outline for the economy? Well, we were pleased to uh, have a call with the Chancellor of the Exchequer on Friday afternoon, where he uh, announced uh, a job support package. We recognise that it is not as generous as the furlough scheme was in terms of uh, assisting employers to keep people in work. It was 80% uh, percent of their salary paid by government. This is two-thirds of the salary uh, paid by government. It doesn't come on stream until the 1st of November. Also welcome the fact that there's £200 million of Barnet consequential to allow us uh, to put together our own schemes to help those industries uh, who will need assistance and support. Um, but, look, whatever assistance and support we can put in place, it will not be as good as people running their business in a normal run of things, and we recognise that, and we can only mitigate uh, uh, damage, and uh, we will try and do our best with the funding that we have available to us, and the funding, of course, which comes from uh, HMG. Keep you can on supplementary. Thank you, First Minister, for the answer so far. With respect to the meeting later on, um, are you content that the executive can get a balanced way forward that looks at economy and health in a balanced, balanced way? Well, I think we do uh, need to recognise, as I've said before, uh, the, the sort of characterisation of health against wealth is, is absolutely a false characterisation. Uh, if people lose their jobs, if they find themselves in poverty, if they find themselves in an unemployed situation, 
then that can lead to really bad health outcomes uh, as well. Uh, I think it was Chris Whitty said yesterday, who is the Chief Medical Officer of course for the UK, if we harm the economy, we harm the long-term health of our people. And I think people need to acknowledge that that is the case, because sometimes we get very focused on the numbers, and they are not good, and I am not suggesting they are good. But when we look at this um, big job of work in front of us today, we have to take a balanced approach. We have to take a proportionate approach, because actually that is what the legislation says that we need to do, to take a proportionate response uh, to what is a very difficult time in our history, Mr Speaker, and I hope that we can come together and find the restrictions and put the restrictions in, so that then the community reacts to those restrictions and we can stop the spread of the virus. We call John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the First Minister for quest for answers so far. First Minister, can I ask what is the time frame currently on introduction of the Irish and Ulster Scots Language Acts? Uh, as the member knows, uh, these are new decade, new approach uh, commitments, as well as the uh, third office that is there f uh, for culture and identity. Uh, it's important that all of these issues move forward together. Uh, the uh, Executive Office is currently looking at all of those issues, and we hope to be able to give an indicative time frame uh, to the committee, of course, uh, who scrutinise the Executive Office in due course, but recognising that uh, in terms of where we are, uh, we would have hoped to have been further on in some of our new decade, new approach commitments, but recognising that we have had to deal with the pandemic in the meantime. John Stewart, supplementary. Thank you, First Minister, for the answer. Um, can you just um, say if the cost of the implementation of that strategy has been fully developed yet and, if, and, and when that will be published? Well, at present, I think the Executive Office have been given a marker bid in terms of uh, the budget. Um, uh, we have not fully costed out the Irish language, uh, uh, Ulster Scots and British identity, and the Office of uh, Culture and Identity, uh, because those are political agreements to move forward on those issues. Uh, it is important that, of course, we deal with them in the most appropriate way, given the current restrictions that we have in terms of our financial capability of doing things. But we also recognise that they are political uh, commitments, and therefore we need to take them forward in the appropriate way. Nicole Joan Bonding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just in light of the, some of the debates yesterday, I would ask the First Minister to give us an update on spend to date of money provided from Her Majesty's Treasury for NDNA, please. I don't have the exact figure in terms of the uh, UK government's uh, commitments on NDNA, but there have been a number of quite significant moves uh, on NDNA. Uh, the Veterans Commissioner, for example, has been appointed. We have extended welfare mitigations, which is a, a big figure, and I'm happy to write to the member around all of that. We have progressed the Hart report on historical institutional abuse, set up a panel on tackling educational underachievement, set up the Centenary Forum and Historical uh, Reference Group, the Joint Board from the Northern Ireland Office and the Northern Ireland Executive have been set up and has met. So there's a lot that has happened in terms of NDNA progress. We accept that had it not been for COVID, there would have been more progress on NDNA. Uh, but I write to the member with the UK spend to date uh, when I have that figure. Supplementary, Joanne Bunding. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And further to the Minister's answer, if I could ask her, if no further money is forthcoming from London, how will the Executive Office decide which projects should be prioritised? So I think that this is a very challenging uh, question, actually, because the NDNA uh, was a political document. Uh, it was the basis on which we all came back into the Assembly after three years outside of government. Um, but I think it is a, a very realistic question as well, uh, because we know that there are huge challenges out there. But as I've said before, it's important, because it is a political agreement across uh, five parties, that we cannot uh, upset the skewing of that, and we have to do it in a balanced way. And the five parties need to decide together on what the priorities are moving forward, because I think that's the only fair way, uh, Mr Speaker, that we can take this forward. Thank you. And the time is up, members. And uh, could I ask members just to take your ease for a moment or two, please?